Uh, so first and foremost, um, dear respected brothers, sisters, elders, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I have, uh, I have never had such a warm welcome uh, ever, and uh, wallahi, this city has a, a piece of my heart. Uh, so thank you guys for being exactly who you are and for making things easy for me uh, with all the hospitality and everything. Uh, naturally, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our sustainer, creator, the source of peace, uh, the source of thanks. Uh, you know, it's always tough. I, I ask myself, how do you thank the one who created thanks? You know? So, uh, and obviously my, um, my love for uh, Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has grown so much over these years. For today's talk, I had a, a quite a bit of a challenge. The challenge was, what gift could I bring that shuyukhs and people of knowledge, because I, I'm not one, I'm not even worthy enough to tie the shoelaces of some of these people that I'm sharing the stage with. Uh, what gift could I bring to you guys to make it relevant to both past and present? And uh, as I go through my talk today, um, it's going to be in the form of a narrative. And I have a, a very potent letter for you today to read, which will also help me in my talk because I'm not the, the best of public speakers. You know, they'd say that. Um, in the times of a funeral, public speaking is the number one fear in the world. So to put it in perspective, you'd rather be the guy in the casket than the guy giving a eulogy, right? And subhanAllah, uh, the, the talk that I have for you today is um, a journey of genocide and guidance. A little bit of a heavy topic for breakfast, but uh, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. So with that being said, uh, that thing that I bring to you today is uh, from a letter, so I'm going to be reading verbatim because I don't want to miss the details of this, um, as it, it, it is, inshallah. So it is uh, something that I don't want to miss the details out. I'm going to be reading a little bit verbatim, and then I'm going to insert some of my reflections from the Quran and Sunnah, inshallah, as I read this to you. So the letter reads, to my unknown family. The year is 1992, and this journey began in the land of Bosnia and Herzegovina, an area filled with luscious forests, magnificent hilltops, fresh springs, and a home to people known for their incredible sense of humor. In the background, a picturesque scene, yet in the foreground, in the foreground, a family is being held at gunpoint, being forced out of their home. War has broken out and buses by the dozen are pulled up to pack families, mine included, like cans of sardines. Guns drawn by some of the military personnel geared and ready. I hear the soldiers yelling, grab what you can and get out. As families are being faced with two options, comply or face death. I feel my mother grab me by the arm and pull me towards the door. Where do you think they'll take us? and quiet down and remain calm were the exchanges between my parents. What are my mother and father to do but seek asylum in neighboring lands? Clearly, the choice to stay was not a choice at all. The lands offering asylum were slim, including Denmark, Poland, and the United States. No matter which choice my parents made, the journey was filled with uncertainty. Who are its people? How are we to communicate without knowing the language? What is the safety of the neighborhoods? How are we to provide for our children? These are some of the questions being asked through the shouts of panic and hysteria. I can only imagine what other thoughts were going through the minds of families that were be not being voiced. A new form of reality has manifested for every child and adult at that moment. As the buses were being filled shoulder to shoulder, a, shoulder, uh, a soldier is announcing names, both first and last, as if to confirm the acceptance for transportation. My family is standing by, listening for their names. I hear the first name of my father being called, and then the second, my mother, and then the third, my sister, and then silence. What about me? I did not hear my own name being called. 
And being young and innocent, I run up to the soldier, tugging at his pant legs, saying with a loud and somewhat challenging voice, you didn't call my name. The soldier looked at me and then looked at my family, and I distinctly remember the sight of my mother's face, pale, stricken, and anxious, and my father's arms gripping and holding my mother and sister with absolute uncertainty and terror. The soldier, with the decision to make, reacted almost as if something compelled him to make the decision for him. Almost instinctively, he quickly kicked me towards my family, turned around, and continued shouting more names. I considered myself lucky at the time, but little did I know. My mother has a sense of relief, yet still she placed me behind her as if to hide my existence just in case there is a follow-up sweep by additional military personnel. We're all, uh, we all begin feeling the bus moving. Upon arriving at the first checkpoint at the border of Croatia, documents needed to be presented to verify the ability to pass through for any asylum seekers. More checkpoints followed suit as we left our buses and boarded trains for Hungary and then Poland. As the nights and days passed, I grew incredibly annoyed of hearing the stuttering of train tracks for the weeks we were traveling. I never thought I would live life on a train for this long. Ironically, as I was reaching a boiling point, the next phase of travel began, only this time by sea. Chapter 84, verse 6 of the Quran says, O humanity, indeed, you are laboring restlessly towards your Lord, and we will eventually meet the consequences. As we step inside the ship, my family is greeted by an embrace of a cold, small room containing a single bed, barely enough for one person. The space was so narrow that the door, the steel door, was prevented from fully opening by the bed frame. My father, witnessing the limited space, turned to my mother and said, you and the children sleep here. I'll go outside and sleep in the hallway. As I walked the deck, I found many other fathers doing the exact same thing. The ship set sail and traveled through the night for Copenhagen, Denmark. When we arrived, I observed a strange, frozen, and icy land greeted by the sounds of foreign language and completely unrecognizable food as Denmark was a fisherman's town, which explained their choice of cuisine. My family was instructed to go forward to the very first sorting center, which was retrofitted from a school gym and basketball courts. Fathers were instructed to separate from their families, women and children on one side, with dedicated tents for housing and men on the other. The sorting center was overwhelmed with people by the look of it. Our family was only allowed to interact with my father in dedicated areas and specified times, such as lunch and dinner. After nearly a week's time, the processing was nearing completion and the order to return to the boat was issued. You would think there's a better solution, but no housing existed to deal with a crisis of this sort. We spent the next two months living on the very boat we came in on. Sick, tired, hungry from food shortages, and what little was available provided a strange cuisine which many children, including myself, refused to eat. Finally, a few days after the two months period of being on this boat, a glimmer of happiness came through as my mother made a petition to the Red Cross to allow us to temporarily house with a first cousin near the dock. The petition was accepted, and we said goodbye to our steel cage. I could see my father was happiest of all since he would finally be able to have a place to sleep after two long months. Upon arrival at a, at a fisherman's cabin, we were greeted by a family of four. Hosting our family would mean eight people in total would be in this small cabin which didn't contain a bathroom. Rather, an outhouse a small distance away was used. We didn't care as the joy of seeing family was more significant. But on chapter 94, verse 5, says, so verily with every difficulty there is relief. For the next three months, we lived together, enjoying each other's company and what little we had. Shortly thereafter, a Red Cross representative arrived at the cabin saying it was time to move to a more permanent location. 
we would finally be able to remove ourselves as a burden to our cousins and his family that hosted us graciously. Once again, buses were loaded with families. As if our journey was beginning anew, each time my sister and I would ask, are we going home now? With the engines roaring and wheels turning, the passengers realized the place we were all being driven to by the Red Cross was a lie. Rather, all of us were being taken to an abandoned mental hospital, which was retrofitted to hold approximately 30 beds per room. The families would need to share a temporary space yet again. At this point, I noticed a stirred up commotion and people were beyond angry by this whole carrot and stick routine. Refugees banded together and refused to leave the bus. They formed a humanitarian strike with a protest in place. The Danish government and the Red Cross were taken by surprise. The Danish government and the Red Cross were taken by surprise since they never expected such coordinated commitment from a people in a desperate situation. Shortly thereafter, journalists covering the event of genocide began to put pressure on the Red Cross. After approximately four days of protest, the Red Cross submitted to the demands of humane treatment to the refugees privately. However, publicly, a different statement needed to be made by the refugees. The demand of the Red Cross was for the refugees to admit to the journalists that the protest was ineffective. And the Red Cross was successful in disbanding the protest. The statement was a condition in which the Red Cross placed on the refugees to take them to their permanent residences which were originally the rights by asylum. Chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 135 says, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even as against yourselves or your parents or your kin, and whether it be against rich or poor. For Allah can best protect both. Follow not the lusts of your hearts lest you swerve, and if you distort justice or decline to do justice, verily, Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. With this small victory, the buses were redirected to travel some hours to the city of Vordingburg. Twenty-five families arrived at a single building containing college-style dorm rooms with one bunk bed and a small locker for clothes. Curiosity struck, so my mother and I walked through the building and we counted two bathrooms, two shower stalls, one kitchen with four stoves, one kitchen with four stoves, and 25 mini refrigerators to serve the 25 families. Yes, you read that correctly. Two bathrooms to serve 25 families many of which had multiple children of various ages. New challenges appeared almost immediately beginning with the need for childhood education. A petition was formed and submitted to the Red Cross office which was located at the building. For what I can remember my parents saying, the plan was to collaborate with a local school for children to gain access to books to learn the language, better understand cultural norms, and of course make friends. Everyone's excitement quickly faded when a denial was issued due to the government's stance on integration of non-Danish natives to a native school system. My parents didn't give up and neither did the parents of other family members. They went back to the drawing board and formed a new petition asking for a dedicated space within schools to enable our adults to educate our own children. This time around, the government agreed. Chapter 96, verse 1 of the Quran says, Read, O Prophet, in the name of your Lord who created. <clears throat> Two months into our stay in this building, a local Danish woman came to the property grounds, asking a rather strange question. 
Who would allow their children to play with mine outside of this place? She asked. Everyone was still hesitant and protective of their kids. She did not get the response that she was looking for. I saw my mother's head pop up from the cautious crowd and she turned to the visitor and said, where are your children? The visitor gave a warm smile and said, they are waiting for us at home. Would you please accompany me to my car with your family so we can host you at our home? Although a great degree of uncertainty was seen in my mother's eyes, the smiles, uh, the smiles my sister and I gave her administered the necessary courage for her to accept the invitation. After a short travel via car, we came up to a private piece of land that housed a massive residence, which had a couple of streams running through it. As the lady opened the door to her home, we were greeted with smiles by her family consisting of two sons, a daughter, and a husband. Once the greeting concluded, we entered a dining area where a lovely dinner was served. This was the first time in nearly a year I had felt that I had eaten real food. Talks about ethnic cleansing, culture, news, politics busied my parents, and I was busy having fun with my sister and hearing her laugh uncontrollably, something which I have not heard in a very long time. Our family soon became heavily intertwined. My father would work odd jobs for our hosts as a form of unemployment, which ran a massive risk if the government ever found out. A year's time passed, and my sister and I were finding some comfort in this new life and I overheard a shocking message from our Danish friends to my father. This place will never accept you. Our system is structured with intent not to naturalize strangers. I fear you will always be treated as second-class individuals, and your children will not have a future like you envisioned. You should continue your journey west to the United States. It had been nearly two years since our arrival to Denmark, and we were being told to leave? My parents started the application process, which took about one month to be accepted. I noticed the Red Cross representative showing up a lot quicker this time. It turns out the Danish government wanted to rid themselves of refugees. As a matter of fact, the Danish crown had incentivized for refugees to leave by offering to pay their way to any country offering asylum. But on chapter 2, verse 155 says, And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger, and loss of wealth, and lives, and fruits, but give good tithings to the patient. Traveling by airplane for the first time was both nerve-wracking and exciting. I have never experienced, uh, I've experienced plenty of turbulence in my life, but never nearly at 40,000 feet in the air. Landing in California, we were greeted by yet another systemic sorting process, along with something that resembled being treated like a medical experiment to administer vaccines. The indent mark left by the vaccine gun they used is distinctly visible in my left arm. We were assigned an apartment in West Los Angeles in an unsafe neighborhood as my parents opened the door to our single bedroom apartment, which included nothing but an empty refrigerator musty carpets, and a visible cockroach infestation. Oddly enough, I could see a sense of relief, a small one, on my parents' face before the mental struggles brought on by many sleepless nights began. Who could blame them, after all? Imagine being in a completely foreign land on the opposite side of the globe and needing to feed two children who thought they were on a massive journey back home. My parents immediately began searching for jobs, with the biggest challenge being their education not recognized, as the systems for accredited education are entirely different between Europe and USA. My father picked up any possible handyman job that he could, painting, driving, maintenance, you name it. My mother ended up babysitting other children, and due to them working two to three jobs at all hours, the real damage to a first-generation refugee finally started to impact me. You see, when your parents are gone and you're left alone, it's only a matter of time before you get influenced by lack of structure and guidance. 
The longer you are without these two elements, the more costly and damaging it becomes. You will often not know the results of the decisions that you make until many, many years later. Nevertheless, I had nothing but time and freedom to meet the people within my new neighborhood. Little did I know that this freedom would come at a price. Just like everything else in life, there's always a price. I started welcoming negative social influences as my guide in decision making, and I noticed making mischief was a fast track to get approval by the so-called friends. Coming from someone that was socially deprived of acknowledgement, I found it incredibly addicting to be accepted by fitting in. I was done sticking out as an outsider, and more than anything, I felt a strong need to belong. The secular West school system was a massive source of misguidance disguised otherwise. My parents felt comfortable leaving me to my teachers and administrators because they were under the false impression the school system would take care of my growth and development. They had no clue the system was designed to indoctrinate and not to educate. And quite frankly, Neither did I. As I progressed my way through junior high, I started learning about sciences, cosmology, mathematics. But where was religion in all of this? Nowhere. By the time high school came around, I was fully convinced that religion in any form was a control mechanism meant to enslave the mind, weaponize the weak, and place boundaries on creativity. Frequent questions of moral dilemma would whirl around my mind. What kind of God would allow war? And if God did exist, why did he not help me and my family throughout my journey? Quran chapter 76 verse 3 and 76 verse 4 says, Indeed we created man from a sperm drop mixture, and we, and that we may try him, and we made him hearing and seeing. Indeed, we guide him to the way be he grateful or be he ungrateful. I chose atheism as my way. Anyone who disagreed with me, I quickly wrote off as a fool that was being manipulated by their social upbringing, having a mind dulled to obey without question. Entering college enabled me to pursue higher education to establish myself worthy to contribute to society. You see, I was studying psychology with a particular interest in cognitive psychology. I found the mind to be a fascinating thing, resilient, adaptive, creative, full of unique potential. The more I studied psychology, I thought to myself, I'm so free and it's up to me to have full control of my own existence. One day during my lectures, we started to study the black box problem. You see, if you're not familiar with it, it's simply put knowing the inputs and outputs of the mind However, we do not understand or know the inner workings of the mind. A provoking question came front and center, almost as if injected. Where did the mind come from? I tried to dismiss it as a stupid question, but it kept scratching at me. Yes, I have a brain. I can clearly see that. But all these great psychologists and scientists in the world and we still have not a single conclusion in regards to the mind? Yeah, sure, there are theories, but I wanna know the conclusion without endless speculation. This should be simple, right? Everything has an explanation, I thought to myself, so surely this should be somewhere in these books from these experts in the field. As I was driving home, the thought refused to leave my presence. Arriving home at the usual time, I greeted my sister and grandmother. It's been many years since my family's arrival to the United States, and both my uncle and grandmother have joined us from overseas. As I was talking with my grandmother and sister, carelessly waving my hands around to this problem that was vexing me, a loud, shattering sound overcame the room and a massive glass vase which decorated our kitchen area was now in hundreds of pieces. My grandmother looked at me and shrieked, Harris, get downstairs right now. Up went my sister to bang on the shower door to get my uncle out of the shower. 
For reasons unknown, my uncle decided to come over to my family's home and take a shower that random day. You see, he was a painter, and whatever he was working on that day made it so that it couldn't wait for him to drive that extra distance to his house for a simple shower. Harris, now, she screamed at the top of her lung again. I looked down and realized that a major artery in my right hand on my wrist had been severed. The sensation felt like something was leaving my body, something more than the obvious blood gushing out, the speed at which looked like water running from a faucet. The flavor of nickel or a piece of metal on my tongue took my taste buds over. My uncle came rushing down the stairs. Call the ambulance, said my grandmother. My sister dialed the phone, and even after two more attempts, still nothing but a deadline. My grandmother quickly grabbed a tourniquet and wrapped it around my arm, tying it tight. I unbuckled my belt at the same time and wrapped it around my arm as tight as possible to slow the blood flow. At this moment, a thought went through my head, and I uttered the words, Please, God, don't take me. In that moment of chaos, as my uncle and sister were jumping into his car to rush me to the hospital, I thought to myself, what did I just say? I'm an atheist. God shouldn't exist. Yet here I am dying by the second as blood continues to be absorbed by my clothing, saying out loud, please God, do not take me. Suddenly and inexplicably, a sense of calm came over me. Is this my adrenaline working? No, it's something else. I have never felt this type of calming sensation before as my uncle was weaving in and out of traffic, hoping to get pulled over, running red lights and blaring his horn. I turned over to my sister who was crying hysterically next to me in the car and with full confidence said to her, do not worry, God will take care of me. She was consumed with panic and couldn't quite internalize what was being said. Chapter 40, verse 60 of the Quran says, And your Lord says, Call upon me, I will respond to you. Indeed, those who disdain my worship will enter hellfire rendered contemptible. Arriving at the trauma room, my hand was kept under pressure for five hours. Looking at my arm, it was black as coal from the lack of blood flow. You see, the trauma surgeon that was supposed to inspect me had left the hospital due to the previous patient dying. The staff assured me that I would be taken care of, yet all I could say to myself was, please God, help me. I did not care about a single word they said. Rather, I turned my attention to God. My mother arrived at the hospital with her employer who was a master surgeon. And I heard him asking the staff, why is his artery not clamped? You're running the risk of amputation. As the trauma surgeon appeared and examined my wrist to check for any additional shards of glass, he looked at me and said, boy, you're lucky to be alive. I replied with great certainty, luck had nothing to do with it. He told me, He'll be releasing the tension of pressure to my arm with a stern warning, saying, this is going to be very painful. Even with Dilaudid, which is a medicine stronger than morphine, I felt everything. It felt like my arm was thrown over searing hot coals, and it refused to let up as the warm blood entered my arm, giving it the rightful color. As I woke up the next day, still at the hospital, I reflected on what happened, my focus being on what prompted me to make this cry for help. Why did I think to ask God rather than to ask for help from science or something else? My quest for the affirmation of God, God's existence began, and I wouldn't stop until I knew the truth. Chapter 12, verse 87 of the Quran says, and, I, and never give up hope of Allah's mercy. Certainly, no one's despair of Allah's mercy except the people who disbelieve. Now that I have abandoned atheism, I was faced with a grand challenge. What is the true path to God? To answer this question, I established some simple principles. I can't make my own decision on subjectivity alone. 
The scriptures must withstand the test of time, both in preservation and prophecy. The message must come from a valid messenger. If one religion was true, then all other religions are false. I'll be sincere if I find the truth, and I must submit. After speaking to friends of different faiths, it was not long before I picked up the Quran. My mother, well in her journey of reading her own copy, would slowly talk to me of her thoughts and findings. I started watching debates, listening to lectures on the biography of the Prophet and his miracles, and the preservation of the Quran. While I was still exploring Islam, my habits of ignorance still plagued me. Yet the closer that I got to Islam, I started feeling more guided to the truth. Fast forward a bit with my journey at this point, I still have not accepted Islam, but I did manage to memorize a short revelation of the Quran, Surah Zilzal. I was sitting on a couch in the garage of an old friend, watching the rain fall, and just as we were about to get high, the surah was replaying in my mind, a beautiful and powerful recitation. I turned to my friend and asked, hey, are we on an earthquake fault line? To which he replied, we're on the San Andreas fault line. It's one of the most famous ones in the United States. I immediately stood up and told him I must go home. Upon my arrival, I went to my mother and declared myself a Muslim by saying the testimony of faith. It was nearly two years into my journey with religion that I finally submit myself. The only religion that hit all the criteria I laid out for myself was Islam. Objectively, it can be proven multiple ways, and the teachings make logical sense and are pragmatic. It continues to withstand the test of time. The messenger is validated by multiple sciences and sources, history included. And since it is indeed true, then all other religions are false by default. Islam gave me the answer to my original problem of the black box, purpose, life, and structure by addressing three key questions. Where did I come from? Which was my black box problem. What am I doing here? Which was my purpose and structure. And where am I going? Which is the afterlife. Allah, the only deity worthy of worship, by his perfect, preserved message, through his beloved messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, provided a way that agreed with both mind and heart, with absolute harmony, an answer to these three questions. Upon realizing this truth, one thing was clear to me. It would be absolutely criminal for me not to share this truth, and my passion for da'wah was born. In conclusion, I want to tell you guys, that, that concludes the letter. Each of our lives contain unique experiences, which you'll find the gift of Allah's mercy and guidance. And hopefully with this letter, I've shown you how Allah can take a life from the depths of despair and empower it to be passionate about Islam and the spread of truth. Now, why do I say this? Imagine the millions of our brothers and sisters across the world that are going through the most challenging of hardships being spread across the earth like seeds. And I leave you with this thought. Even the smallest acorn can grow into the largest oak tree. Will you not choose to water that with Islam? For you see, the things that have been happening in the past to me and the things that are currently happening to our brothers and sisters, we have a choice. We have a choice to be that heroic uncle. We have a choice to be that caring cousin, be it short or distant. We have a choice to make when we're faced with the truth and what our commitment is to this truth. And it's incumbent on us to make the correct choice. So as these tragedies are happening, we hear a lot about the martyrdom of our brothers and sisters. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them the highest level of paradise. But often what we do not hear about is the stories of the survivors. 
And we do not see the majesty, the wisdom, and the beauty of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spreads us out like these seeds. And we choose, or we have a choice to water ourselves with truth, knowledge, structure, the deen, or we can choose to water ourselves with ignorance, hate, distrust, and joining these social norms that are just outright degrading to the ennoblement that is a human being. So I encourage you guys as we go forward and as you go throughout your day to please consider the people that are surviving and that need help because your help matters no matter how big or small. This does conclude my talk for today. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahabla Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa sahab Ibrahim innaka hamidu majid and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu it's been a pleasure being here and I'm happy to field uh, any questions that you may have inshallah yes brother the book mashallah bro you give me way too much credit no this is just a letter yeah but thank you so much for that question. It was a lovely question. That means I must have done some type of a decent job. <laughs> nah. This is my story. Uh, the country is Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yes. So I tried to uh, uh, draw a parallel. And you know, as my challenge of being here today with uh, Mashallah, all these shayukh and people of knowledge, when they're instilling this type of knowledge, and I see that you guys are here in attendance, dedicating your time, uh, just know that it's, it's not to waste. Because the people that I have interacted with through my life have all given me small golden nuggets of Islam. And since they gave me those golden nuggets, I was able to collect enough in order to uh, recognize the truth by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Yes. I guess this will be very specific. So, so, I know you have a good background, so I know you have a good one of the main people that I feel like are so many more thoughts. And I know you have an instilled hatred towards this thing. Not necessarily from the Muslim people, just how they make a vision of their father. So, I know that we call an individual that I'd say has accepted his life in turn, mm -hmm. not so much having to do with their family reasons, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of shift in the media that I've heard about. So, kind of, of course, we can hear something that we hear from that background. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, the brother asked, uh, he said that he's dealing with a lot of Orthodox Serbs and uh, what kind of advice would I have for the gentleman who has accepted Islam internally but is not able to publicize it because uh, externally uh, he's in a state of danger. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the connection that we have between us and Allah is, is a direct one. And the most important entity to please is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows this gentleman's condition. And he knows truly if he did accept Islam, and inshallah he did. Now in regards to the, the hatred, because I kind of want to chop this up a little bit. An example of what happened not but two days ago, you had the United Nations accept a resolution in regards to the genocide of Srebrenica. Now why is this important? It's important because the precedent set in the history books is now going to reflect what the truth is. Meaning, you can no longer conceal it. If you do conceal it, it'll be localized. But many of these people, they work in the neighboring lands. So they'll travel to like Germany or somewhere neighboring there, Italy. And when they're interacting with those locals, they will get a different type of uh, interaction. Maybe they might say something like, oh, I'm from Serbia. And now, whereas in the past, that would just be like, oh, I know where that is. Now it's like, hey, don't, what about that UN resolution? Or now, now that this has happened, how do you feel, right? Point being is things do take time. Just like when you sit there and talk to this individual in regards to his journey with Islam and his acceptance, to shift the entire mental conditioning of a people, it, it's extremely difficult. But we shouldn't give up hope 
So uh, this gentleman can obviously practice Islam to whatever his capacity is, right? He can head over to the masajids. He can do, uh, conduct the actions in a safe environment because uh, in Islam, the one thing that I've learned is there's a, a high value on the preservation of life. Why would, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to go put ourselves in danger in any way, shape, or form, right? Follow up on that, so let's say, for example, as you mentioned, just stay here in Ramadan because he lives with his parents. Mm -hmm. If they were to question why are you not eating all day and it's continuously over and over, mm -hmm. they would get suspicious. So, for example, if he's made like able to conceal his prayers, mm -hmm. for example, they, they would celebrate Christmas and they'd have to leave there with him. Mm -hmm. So he has this kind of worries of what, what am I unable to do and mm -hmm. certain things that I shouldn't do that I have to do. Mm -hmm. so, He's concerned about how to go about this sort of Yeah, you know what, bro? For stuff like this, it's best to talk to a local imam. And, and here's the reason why I say it. Not to try to deflect. I, I can give you <clears throat> small things that you can put into practice. Like, for example, fasting is between you and Allah. No one is really going to know whether or not you ate or not. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should go and lie to your parents. Like, say, like, oh, I already ate. No, but simply saying, you know what, thanks, I'm not really hungry. Step out for 10 minutes because over there, everything is within a walking distance and come back. They're not going to know if you ate a piece of bread or didn't, right? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know, right? So that's, that's in regards to that. Now, in regards to events like Christmas and so on, remember that uh, we're judged based off of our intentions and the actions that follow suit. So if his intention is to worship and his intention is to celebrate that event for the purposes of worship, then he's in trouble. So he can just stand there. He doesn't have to participate in the festivities knowing that hey, I'm completely disconnected to these people and the reason why I say that he should visit a local imam is because they'll have a sound cultural understanding and they'll also have a temperature gauge of what's currently happening so when he talks to them locally they'll be able to give him more localized advice you know like the things that are happening here uh, I, was, I was about to say California, but then I remembered I'm, I'm, I'm in New Jersey, which is, alhamdulillah, an amazing place. So, um, the things that are happening here are completely different than things that are happening over there. So, you know, it, it would be uh, a, an error for me to say, hey, you should tell him this or something like that. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable to, to say that because I don't want to put him in a position of, of struggle, right? So, inshallah, bro, sorry, I wish I could expunge upon that a little bit more, but alhamdulillah, I'm glad that he's there. I'm, I'm glad that he's there. Uh, yes, bro. So, did, did the glass vase fall in Shattered. Shattered? Yeah. Yeah. And there was a shard that literally sliced all right here. Yeah. So, yeah. How, did it, how did it fall? Me. Oh. Just clumsy. I was waving my hands around, talking. It was clumsy. It was sitting on a bar. It was a, it was a big, like, it's not like this, yeah. you know, it's <laughs> big with like really thick, like, so it must have been like the tip or something like that that just, you know, I don't know. It happened, when I tell you that it happened in a, in a split second, I'm telling you, it was in the blink of an eye. I didn't even realize it because when, when you sever an artery and the nerves that are here, you don't feel it. You know, like how we have halal ways of um, slaughtering animals. Yeah. This is a really weird comparison, man, but like when this happened, it was like, I would just pinch you. So it was nothing. And then it just, Sorry. yeah. So what was your uncle's relation to, I thought like he was showering and then he was. He was. So for some random day, I can't quite explain it. He had every choice to go to his house, but for some reason, which again, I still don't know what it is internally. I know what he told me. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm filthy. I'm going to go run up, you know, and, and kind of take a shower kind of thing, you know? So he's just clamoring, going about his business, you know? The guy came like soaking wet, just put on pants. I mean, he was dripping wet, man, because he was just pounding on the door, screaming to get him. Yeah, he just came screaming down. Yeah, let me get this brother back here. Yes. Alexander. To break the ice? Hey, what's up, man? I'm Morris. <laughs> Are you talking about to get into Dawa? Yeah, to talk about Islam. Yeah, well, Lahi, man, it just, when you just stand there and you gauge the person, 
you can see, like for example, when I, uh, you know, uh, alhamdulillah we were out yesterday and uh, people are just walking by and if you just offer them a flyer, some of them they don't, they just walk by you like you're not, you're not even a human being. But I think to myself always that if we were ever in like a coffee shop or something, they would treat me normal. So I let them go about their day because I remember that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that creates the opportunity for the pattern and it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that makes that connection happen. So you can say exactly what you need to say or be the friendliest person, but don't let that distract you from the next person. This guy might be having a bad day. Who knows what kind of struggles this person's having. Uh, maybe this guy's family member may have passed away. They just lost their job. They're just out on a jog or whatever. But honestly, man, you just say hello. You just, you, you the, and uh, the thing that I've learned the most about Dawa, you know what's the most impactful thing? Is you just being there. If your presence is there, it's enough. Wallahi, it's enough because they see that this isn't happening anywhere else. So just say hi to people. You've got nothing to lose, bro. You've got absolutely nothing to lose. Turn your body toward them. Salaamu Alaikum. I, I usually have a, a pamphlet that has something in regards to Islam that's very simple. And I say, can I just share this knowledge with you? It's some free literature. You know, take this. And if there's a person that takes it and approaches you or do you, you know, I don't say things like, do you have any questions? I use presumptive language. So I say, what questions do you have? And then they go, what questions do I have? Uh, about what? You know, about like food? <laughs> what? <laughs> and then the conversation starts from there. And just let it flow, man. Be yourself. Be genuinely interested in the person. Because look, um, this whole journey with me, you had massive amounts of ignorance and being brought back to guidance. And when I say that every single person has had this unique experience, not this one, but something unique to them, nobody can tell me with a straight face that they have not been guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody could tell me that internally, instinctively, and psychologically, they've never been checked. Hey, you shouldn't do this. This doesn't feel good. Nobody. Because Wallah, you know, in the Quran, it tells us whether I guide them, whether they're grateful or ungrateful. But it's recognizing it is the key. And now you're just trying to share that recognition. I think there was another. Inshallah, hopefully that helps. Let me get over here and then I'll come over here. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. So, hey, you know what's funny, Akhi, uh, this is a beautiful question. He's asking, how often should we follow up with the people that we talk to in regards to Islam? Uh, I don't see it as a business transaction. And I would say that depending on where you guys left off and how often do you regularly see each other. Let's say if it's someone that you see once a year. You know what I mean? Or maybe they're a distance away from you. But compared to someone that you see once a day, you know, every three days, like let's say it's a school colleague or something like that, right? There's two types of follow-ups. There's direct and then there's indirect. Indirect is, you guys are hanging out. Brother, I just gotta pray real quick. Just give, me, give me a minute. I'm gonna go make wudu. Can I, do you mind if I get a cool corner in your house over here or something like that? This is follow-up. And the, the second one is direct. Hey, bro, I, I, I was curious, like, what did you think about that piece of literature that I gave you? Or what did you think about this? And then, you know, there's kind of like something in between where it's not prompted, but something comes up in your mind like, oh, I remember this one story about the Prophet, or I remember this one story about this in the Quran or something like that, and something happened to me, and I just had to share this with you, and I related it to this. Crazy, right? So there's no like systematic way and you know subhanAllah I've had people that I've talked to a year ago, two years ago that they, they came across something in their life and then they reach out to me and they go hey man that one thing that you mentioned crazy story and then they 
you know, the, the conversation sparks up. Don't be overbearing. Don't be like, you don't want to become that guy where you get ostracized because that's all you talk about. Because we're supposed to be living the Quran. We're supposed to be living Islam. We're supposed to be, so people will see it like, the best form of da'wah really is, is just to stay true to what it, what it teaches and people will see it naturally through your character. Some people, actually most people, are emotionally driven. They're not, they're not factually and informationally driven. You can hit them with all the facts in the world, but if they don't like you, meaning your words are bitter, like your actions are bitter, what do they care? What do they care, man? Yeah, bismillah, yeah. I'm saying with love, bro. Yes. a great question. Um, no, I was not a, naturally like this. I actually, uh, when I was younger, right, in my J days, my Jahiliya days, um, people would consider me as extremely arrogant. I had to be right, you know, no matter what. I, I, I was just, I was a jerk, you know, to, to, to put it lightly. Like, I was, not, I was not someone that people would necessarily want to hang out with and you know, I would try to fact check people and, and alhamdulillah, like actually Islam and seeing the, the way that the prophets السلام, delivered the message, how they dealt with like, let's say Fir'aun, right? And what was the instruction? You have to be cordial, you have to be nice, speak, speak gently to him. Um, it takes time and it takes a lot of practice. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you guys that my mother has taught me too. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her. Uh, and all of our mothers, I mean. She said, son, the strongest people alive are ones that can control their emotions. And it's true. Next time when somebody ticks you off, try biting your tongue. It's hard, man. It really is hard. Next time when you know what the correct answer is, but the person is like vibrantly enjoying themselves, there's a way to talk to them so that it, you, you bring them down gently. You don't just smash them. Because here's the deal, and, and this is another thing in regards to giving um, a, a approachability of people, right? When you're talking to them about Islam, here's what you're saying. Passively, here's what you're saying. Hey, uh, brother, everything you've ever been taught in your life is a lie. That's literally what you're saying. Everything that you know in regards to religion is just the biggest load of malarkey. And me, I'm here to tell you what's what. And how do you convince the other person that you're actually here to tell them what the truth is? And then the toughest form, the toughest form, is this gentleman, right, uh, the, your friend that had accepted Islam. Imagine doing that to your parents. And they look at you and they go, I used to change your diaper. What are you going to teach me? Shut up, sit down. This is how. It's, and, it, and it runs the gamut. The way that you talk to your mom, the way that you talk to your dad, depending on the relationship that you have, is going to be different than the way that you talk to me. You know, and you have to have thick skin and wallahi, you need a lot of sabr and I get corrected all the time. As a matter of fact, even yesterday when I was giving dawah, there was a, a, an atheist gentleman that was speaking with uh, Brother Muhammad Ali and I noticed that, you know, obviously I'm not going to interrupt their conversation. The guy's clearly, he can handle it, right? When they finished their conversation, I waited, when they, I waited, you know, when they finished their conversation, the guy's coming out. And uh, I said, hey, excuse me, before you leave really quickly, I was like, how did your conversation go? You know, just wanted to kind of 
touch, touch base with them and say, like, did you, did you gain anything, kind of? Well, you know, I still don't really believe, because, like, why would there be the same moral problem, typical as always? And then I told him straight up, I said, look, I used to be like you, relatability, right? Hey, uh, you're fleshy, I'm fleshy, you're an atheist, I was a former atheist, you know, just talk to me, bro, level with me. And then I hit him with the reality. And I told him, bro, you're more of a believer in something that you have no evidence for. Because I told him, I said, I probed the depth of your knowledge. I literally said, give me the evidences for no existence of God. Well, 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 well. Now the whole shebang, right? And then I said, why do you do that? Why do you do that, dude? Why, why, do, you, why do you accept it? Why are you acting that way? And I asked him, what do you do for a living? He's like, oh, I do chemical engineering. I said, okay, cool. So if you were building up a chemical and you made a mistake because you thought it was the right thing to do, but you had no evidences for it, and it like disintegrated a building or whatever, what would happen to you? Oh, I'd lose my job and all this other stuff. Said, okay, cool. So why are you doing that with your life? Why are you doing that with your afterlife? How are you so certain on everything yet you have no evidences for it? Well, you know, I'm a, okay. And he got, and then, you know what he, you know what he sa says to me? <laughs> this is the point. Sorry, I can bird walk a lot. Thank you for your patience. He turns to me and he goes, you know, I spoke to that other guy, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, he's a lot nicer than you. <laughs> and I said, really? He goes, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, well, well yeah, he's very nice. Like, Mashallah, alhamdulillah, bro. The thing is, I wasn't mean to the guy. I was just real with him. And Muhammad Ali, I, I, I walked up to him and I told him, he's like, hey, what happened with the brother when you talked to him? I said, yeah, you know, I had this exchange. And then he goes, he's a lot, he, he, he liked talking to you because you're a lot nicer. And he goes, what'd you tell him? <laughs> and I said, nothing. I just, I gave him the reality check. You know, I said, like, look, man, we're all here trying to get upon truth. Why? Why are you doing this stuff? And then he goes, yeah, well, Lahi, bro, with these people, you have to be so patient. And now what's the takeaway with me? That even though that I exerted that much patience, I have to do more. Because they're not going to, they're not going to remember what you told them. But they will remember how you treated them. They will remember it. They're not, they may not remember exactly what you look like, but they're going to remember a, an inkling on the sound of your voice and what impact it had. So, how to conduct the dawah? Leave the person in a better place than you found them. It doesn't mean you have to do it with knowledge. They can just say, you know what, I had a wonderful interaction with a Muslim. And man, to this day I can't remember what he said, but he was, he was an okay guy. You know, and then drip, 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 drip. And inshallah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide him. Any other questions? Uh, I think there was a couple. Of them. Salam alaikum, bro. Alaikum. That's a tough question, man. Um, Islamically, there are, just like anywhere else, there's people that are on their deen and there's people that are not on their deen. Uh, the, the, you know, subhanAllah, I was just there uh, visiting uh, family. Wallahi, man, I've never seen people that had uh, such a vibrant sense of humor despite the circumstances. They, they are very, very good people, very um, pleasant to be around. Now, in regards to Islam, I view it that obviously Islam has no borders and the most important thing is how are you conducting yourself in your own household? Beginning with yourself. The reason why I say that is because from the outside, I see the masajids full. Uh, I see people, you know, hijab and dressing modestly and, and so on. But there's also the other side, which is you have restaurants that have alcohol in them. You have smoking that's run rampant. You have cultural influences that are um, encroaching and uh, albeit even stepping foot on the principalities of Islam. Uh, if I were to sum it up, I would sum it up in a manner that's befitting everywhere. 
And I would sum it up like this, uh, we need to do better. That's it. Just, just push for better, you know, and try to be more resilient and stuff, but highly encourage that you visit because you'll, you'll have a wonderful time. The people are, are very wonderful people, mashallah. So, and I'm, I obviously, like, I'm a little biased, okay? Like, yeah, sure. Jazakallah you know. <laughs> khair. If we, uh, well, inshallah, we'll have a Q&A session. If we can... Uh...